Later that same year, Mohammed appears at the U.S. Embassy in Cairo. He offers his services as an informant. CIA officials in Cairo are skeptical. The Egyptians warn them that Ali Mohammed is a radical Muslim. Nonetheless, the Cairo office lets its counterparts around the world know that Ali Mohammed is available for an assignment. A response comes back from the CIA in West Germany. It could use a man like Ali. As a result, Mohammed goes on a mission for the CIA. His assignment? Infiltrate a mosque here in Hamburg with ties to Hezbollah. Mohammed quickly reveals himself. Ali goes in and over the course of a week he lets it be known um, to the people in the mosque that um, he's actually been sent there at the behest of the agency. CIA officials quickly find out that Mohammed has betrayed them. The agency says it terminates its relationship with him. The U.S. State Department adds Mohammed's name to a watch list as a suspected terrorist. But Sawari has bigger plans for Mohammed. He sends him on his next mission. Enter the United States and keep looking for ways to infiltrate U.S. intelligence. Even though Mohammed's name is on a watch list, the State Department issues him a visa. At the time, officials are simply not focused on terrorist threats inside the U.S. One news report would later say Mohammed gets past the watch list with CIA help. Did somebody close their eyes and just sign off something and give it to him? We were never able to confirm that. I think it's a function of A, not knowing what B is doing, and that he took advantage of it. Either way, Mohammed heads for America, looking to exploit any weakness in security that he can find. 1984. Ali Mohammed is a major in the Egyptian army. He is a highly educated, speaking several languages and possessing two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree. In 1981, he was taking part in a special program for foreign officers at the U.S. Army Special Forces School at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, while soldiers with radical Islamic beliefs from his Egyptian army unit assassinated Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. He is forced to quit in early 1984 on suspicions of becoming too religious. He approaches the CIA in Egypt and volunteers to be a spy. The CIA accepts and he makes contact in Germany with a branch of Hezbollah, the Middle Eastern militant group. The CIA has claimed that Mohammed secretly tells Hezbollah members that he is working with the CIA, but the CIA quickly discovers this. The agency supposedly suspects he wanted to help Hezbollah spy on the CIA and cuts off all further ties with him and tries to stop him from coming to the United States but there will be claims that Mohammed then will come to the U.S. through a secret CIA program. If true, this would cast doubt on the CIA's account of their interaction with Mohammed. By 1986, Mohammed enlists in the U.S. Army and is posted to Force Bragg, North Carolina. He works first as a supply sergeant for a Green Beret unit and then as an instructor at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School. Fort Bragg is no ordinary military base. One newspaper calls it the U.S. military's top warfare planning center. Mohammed will steal numerous top secret documents and pass them to Al-Qaeda. Mohammed trains and lectures soldiers being deployed to the Middle East on the region's culture and politics. He also produces and appears in training videotapes about the Middle East. In one tape, he asserts that devout Muslims owe too widely misunderstood. The term of fundamentalism scares people in the West. Everybody, when he hears fundamentalist, he thinks about armed struggle. He thinks about radicals. He thinks about groups that are carrying weapons. The word fundamentalism does not mean extremism. It means just that ordinary Muslims accept everything, that this is my way. One of his superior supervisors is Colonel Norvell de Atkin. He would later say of Muhammad, I don't think he was anti-American. He was what I would call a Muslim fundamentalist, which isn't a bomb, however. I would not put him in that category. Dayat Keen is also an expert on the Middle East and on the political aspects of military operations. In one of his articles, he will praise the propaganda preparation for the Gulf War. 
The Atkin will also contribute articles to Middle East Forum, an aggressively neoconservative and pro-Israel journal edited by Daniel Pipes. One of these, a denunciation of leftist and Arab influence in academia, will be written together with Pipes. In the mid-1980s, Khaled Abu al-Dahab, an Egyptian medical student, joins the militant group Islamic Jihad and meets with Ali Muhammad. Muhammad convinces al-Dahab to move to the United States and becomes a sleeper cell agent. Al-Dahab does so in 1987, moving to Santa Clara, California, where Muhammad has a residence. Al-Dahab marries an American woman, becomes a U.S. citizen, and gets a job at a computer company. In 1987, a female acquaintance of Al-Dahab enters his apartment unannounced and finds several men there cleaning rifles. She decides it is something she does not want to know about and breaks off contact with him. In 1990, Muhammad and Al-Dahab travel together to Afghanistan. They are financially supported by a network of U.S. sympathizers, including two Egyptian-American doctors. Beginning in 1990, Al-Dahab's apartment becomes an important communications hub for Al-Qaeda and Islamic Jihad cells all over the world. For much of the 1990s, the Egyptian government cut direct phone links to countries like the Sudan, Yemen, Afghanistan, or Pakistan in an effort to disrupt the communications between radical militants. The Hob acts as a telephone operator for the Islamic Jihad network, using a three-way calling feature to connect operatives in far-flung countries. He communicates with bin Laden's base in the Sudan. He receives phone calls from the likes of Islamic Jihad leader, Dr. Ayman al-Zwahari, who also visits California twice during the spring of 1993 and late 94. He distributes forged documents and makes money transfers. He is trained to make booby-trapped letters, enrolls in a U.S. flight school to learn how to fly gilders and helicopters, and recruits additional U.S. sleeper agents. He helps translate U.S. Army manuals and topographical maps into Arabic for al-Qaeda and Islamic Jihad training. El Dahab would move to Egypt in 1998 and gets arrested in October of that year. He would later confess his role in all of this in an Egyptian trial in 1999, where the government would sentence him to 15 years in prison. Ali Muhammad, while still an instructor at Fort Bragg, frequently spends his weekends traveling to meet with Islamic activists at the al Kifa Refugee Center in Brooklyn. This center is the Brooklyn branch of the Maktab al kidamat which is a charity front in Pakistan closely tied to bin Laden and his mentor, Abdullah Azam. It also has ties to the CIA. Muhammad teaches the Islamic activists survival techniques, map reading, and how to recognize tanks and other Soviet weapons. He frequently stays at the home of El Said Nasser. The FBI monitors him teaching Nasser and some of the future members of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing plot how to shoot weapons. Towards the end of this period, he informs his superiors that he has renewed his association with Gamma Islamia member Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. Muhammad will move to Brooklyn in May of 1990, while also keeping a residence in Santa Clara, California. His connections to the Islamic network developed rapidly from this point on. By 1988, Muhammad, who begins instructing at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare School at Fort Bragg, travels to Afghanistan to train the Mujahideen. He tells friends that he plans to join the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and kill Russians. He informs Supervisor Lieutenant Colonel Steve Neely of his plans, who passes the information up the chain of command to Lieutenant Colonel Robert Anderson, Muhammad's commanding officer, and also reports Muhammad's suspicious activities to Fort Bragg officials and Army intelligence, but gets no response. Muhammad takes one month of leave and goes to Afghanistan. No action is taken to prevent him from doing this. When he returns, he boasts of his combat exploits to his colleague, Lieutenant Colonel Anderson, writes up a second report, and again gets no response. Freelance fighting would be a serious breach of military rules, and the New York Times will later note that, quote, 
the capture or death of an American serviceman in Afghanistan would have been a major international embarrassment to the United States, end quote. However, no disciplinary action is taken against him. This leads Anderson to conclude that Muhammad's activities are sponsored by a U.S. intelligence agency. Anderson will state, quote, I think you or I would have a better chance of winning the lottery than an Egyptian major in the unit that assassinated Egyptian President Anwar Sadat would have getting a visa, getting to California, getting into the army, and getting assigned to a special forces unit. That just doesn't happen, end quote. He will also add that it is equally unthinkable that an ordinary U.S. soldier would go unpunished after fighting in a foreign war. Muhammad is also stealing classified documents from the base. Some of them would be discovered by U.S. investigators in 1990. According to a U.S. Army spokesman, an officer working with Muhammad did have some suspicions about what he did, but nothing came as a result of it. It really depended on who you believed. In July of 1989, FBI agents photographed Islamic radicals shooting weapons at the Calverton shooting range on Long Island, New York. The radicals are secretly monitored as they shoot AK-47 assault rifles, semi-automatic handguns, and revolvers for four successive weekends. The use of weapons such as AK-47s is illegal in the U.S., but this shooting range is known to be unusually permissive. Ali Muhammad is apparently not at the range, but has been training the five men there. El Saeed Nosser, Mahmoud Amalima, Mohammed Salome, Nadel Ayad, and Clement Rodney Hemptiel. Nosser will later assassinate Rabbi Amir Kahani on November 5th of 1990, and the others, except Hemptiel, will be convicted of their participation in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing on February 26, 1993. While Hampton L. will be convicted for a role in the landmarks bombing plot on June 24th, 1993. Some FBI agents have been assigned to watch some Middle Eastern men who are frequently the, or frequented the Al Kifa Refugee Center in Brooklyn. Each weekend, Muhammad's trainees drive from Al Kifa to the shooting range, and a small FBI surveillance team follows them. The FBI has been given a tip that some Palestinians at Al Kifa are planning violence targeting Atlantic City casinos. By August, the casino plot will have failed to materialize and the surveillance, including that at the shooting range, will have come to an end. Later, author Peter Lance will later comment that the reason why the FBI failed to follow up the shooting session is a great unanswered question. The beginnings of a terrorist organization has begun. The wheels will keep moving in the next decade.